Hello, a very warm good morning to all of you and welcome to An Academy. Welcome to today's The Hindu Newspaper Analysis, where we pick up the Delhi edition of today's The Hindu Newspaper and analyze the articles which have appeared there for its relevance in the prelims or the mains examination. So today, the topics that we are going to discuss are listed here. So today, as you can see, in total, we are going to discuss 10 topics with its relevance varied both for prelims and the mains exam, as we are going to discuss with each of these topics about what their individual relevance is. And at the end of the discussion, we shall take up the discussion for answer writing as well. We shall be picking up two of the subjective questions as is the norm and thereby try to think about how to create the answers. And I do urge suggest and advise to all of you to try to write the answers on your own and thereby try to improvise in that regards. Now today the topics that we are going to discuss range from a wide variety of GS paper 1 all the way to GS paper 3 and one by one let us analyze the topics. So starting with the first topic of the day which has appeared in the front page of the newspaper itself and that is households debt surge to a new high by December 2023. So this is something which has appeared in the first page. This is relevant for your GS paper 3. Now, what does this article talk about? So, this article tells you that the debt levels of individual households, that has been rising quite significantly. Debt levels as in the amount of money that the households owe to any financial institutions, to banks, to lenders, etc. So, that debt level has been rising. Now, obviously, if anyone is indebted, if anybody has taken loan and overall, if you take an average of the households and their loan amount is increasing, that is never a good news for any economic setup. But majority of the countries and majority of the economies of the world, they do pass through this phase where the debt levels, they do increase. Slowly and steadily, for example, as the households, they become sometimes even more confident. Let's suppose they want to buy a new house. They want to purchase a new car because they are confident about the economic setup. They are confident and bullish about their future. So they will take up the loans to buy a costly house, a costly vehicle for that matter. So that can also increase the debt levels. Just the increase in debt levels is not so alarming a situation. But along with that, another metric has been presented. And this is as per a report of the financial firm Motilal Oswal, which has carried out a detailed analysis and that has largely corroborated the fact of the findings that RBI had published even last year. Now, as I told you, just the sheer rise in debt levels is not a cause of alarm. But along with that, another alarming factor is that the savings rate, the household savings rate, that has been decreasing. Overall, if you take a look at the savings rate of the households, that has been decreasing from a peak of around 7.5% achieved almost in 2011-2012, it has reduced to almost 5%. So here, there are two key extracts from this entire news article and let us extrapolate those extracts. So first is that the debt levels have risen. Debt levels, they have gone up. They have reached to a level of around 40.1% for the households. And simultaneously, household savings, these savings have gone down to around 5%. Now, together both of these, they are a harbinger of bad news. Ideally, for any particular economic setup, the national savings, the total amount of savings that you have, if the savings rate is higher, it is better for the national growth in the long run. So, there, when you talk about the savings in an economy, if the savings rate goes higher up, that is always going to be beneficial for growth. Why? Because savings, if they are more in the national economy, means what? 
you have saved significant amount of money which you can then deploy for let's suppose improving the educational standards for improving the capital assets that you have the investments that you make so in all those cases you can virtually use your savings and in all these avenues if you put in money that is going to yield a further growth isn't it so here with the increase in savings more investments can happen right more investments where in capital assets capital acquisition you can create more more investment can be done in healthcare so that human capital can be realized education welfare schemes and well being so that is why the savings if in the national gdp if the savings rate is good enough that is always healthy china is also suffering from a low savings rate india traditionally and historically used to do well on this parameter but for the past almost a couple of decades our savings rate has shown a kind of a secular decline the overall national savings that has started reducing now in the entirety of the savings you have a significant chunk which is composed of household savings that is savings made by the households overall at the national level savings include the savings by the household savings by the corporate savings by the government all of that is included in the national savings but here the component that we are going to focus upon is the household savings now at the household level it basically comprises of around 20% of the national savings right so as i told you savings is of three different parameters household corporate and the savings by the government now the government generally runs in deficit so there you don't have much saving then household savings they compose of 20% of the overall basket now that is a significant chunk now even within that 20% you have a further classification of the household savings into two types one is into financial segment and other is the non financial saving for example let's suppose i have bought gold now that is not a financial saving that i am doing i am buying an asset because gold i feel is inflation proof gold will give me money in the dire circumstances also so that is why you will find many of the indian households they save and they buy gold that is not a financial saving if you put your money into a bank account if you pledge your money somewhere that is your financial saving so even these household savings they are classified into those but does this household saving means only the individual families what they save no small businesses msmes in many of the cases on a smaller scale petty uh, shop owners all of them they are included within that bracket of household savings okay so this household savings includes small businesses then includes small shops and also the overall household savings at the family level now this is divided into financial and non financial now when we say non financial that is basically the case for example gold okay now financial savings when you talk about it is this ratio which is reducing it has reduced and dropped to around 5% now why is it that this saving rate has decreased now there are counter arguments and arguments made from different side of the spectrum that this is the reason why the financial savings have dropped few of the arguments from the side of the finance ministry has been that look people are so very confident in the performance of the economy they don't want to save any more they are spending more splurging more to buy houses cars etc that is why you don't see that savings rate but the other side of the stark reality can be maybe people don't have enough to save enough 
anyways, this household saving is only being done and can only be done by well-to-do and rich households. The poorer households, their ability to save already is very, very low. So what are the reasons, if you, uh, if you basically summarize, the reasons why this saving rate is going down? So when we talk about the reasons, one of the reasons can be inflation. As there has been a rise in prices for food items in particular for the past couple of years and furthermore, even if you look back also. So if you buy items at a costlier price, your ability to save automatically will reduce, isn't it? So inflation is one of the factors. Other factor can be no real rise in income level. Right? That also has led to a reduction in the amount of savings. The total amount of money which could be saved, that has reduced. Then also, no real job creation in the sense of large numbers of job creation that has been picking up for the past quarter in this particular quarter. But before that, we were going through a kind of a lull because of the global economic scenario and the global economic output where the demand for goods never really picked up after the Russia-Ukraine war. So the global scenario also has got to do with that. And then another factor why the rate of financial saving is less is also because of less financial penetration. What do we mean by that? The instruments for financial savings, be it your NPS, be it your PPF, be it your savings account, or any of the formalized methods of financial saving, their penetration is very restricted to a kind of middle class income and not has, penet has not penetrated completely to the grassroots. So the lack of financial penetration in many of the cases is also being accounted as and attributed as one of the reasons for low savings rate. So lack of financial penetration. Financial penetration. Right? But then, simultaneously, the debt levels have been increasing. So how is it happening and why is it happening? So the rise in debt levels have been primarily attributed to the aspect that if you have unsecured personal loans, there the quantum is rising. It is not as if your scheduled commercial banks like the SBI, ICICI, it is not like these banks are lending much more now. No, most of you would have been troubled by these incessant phone calls that I'm calling from this particular NBFC, I'm calling from this particular financial institution. If you want to take some loan, etc., you are eligible for this much amount of loan. So unsecured personal loans, they are being handed out very easily. So one of the key proponents of this rising debt level has been the lending by the NBFCs. Lending by NBFCs. Just to give you an idea, this non-banking financial corporation, the NBFCs that you have, now in 2021 and 22, they lent out an amount that is 2021 to 22. They lent out an amount which was around rupees 21,000 crores as lending, as loans. In one year, in the year of 2022-23, can you guess the amount of money that they lent out? It was a whopping rupees 2.4 lakh crores. So think about it. In one year, the amount of lending which has been done by the NBFCs is almost 10 times and more. Now, majority of that lending is, has been done to the households at an unsecured basis. That is, you don't have any particular real collateral for that particular loan and easy remittance or the easy issuance of loans has been done. Now, that opens up the economy to multiple different risks. One of the risks is 
that you won't have or rather you would generate so much amount of non-performing assets because the people will not have the ability to pay back loans unless and until the economy is doing really good and unless and until all of the people, their level of economic status is growing continuously. There is a real probability of this turning into NPAs. Secondly, unaccounted for loans in the market leads to that sudden increase in money supply. And that sudden rise in money supply can give rise to an uncontrolled inflation because the demand supply curve simply goes out of the window. So that is one of the cause of worry. Now, uh, fingers crossed, I, we all hope and the larger economic sector is pinning the hope that this loan is something which the people would repay depending upon their own individual ability. But then what is the issue here? If let's suppose you have a high debt level of the households, low saving rate of the households, how does it impact the national economy? Is it that individual households only have to worry about it or is there an implication on the national economy as well? So the answer is that there is a real implication on the national economy as well. How? So when you have more amount of savings, that means that there will be more amount of funds given to the banks. Where do you put your savings? In financial institutions. As you grow more confident about the financial system, you put money in the financial institutions. So that means more money to banks. More deposits. Now, if you have more deposits that you have made to the banks, means what? The banks have a greater ability to lend, right? More lending. More lending. Now, they will lend to whom? The corporates, the business houses, in order to expand their, uh, let's suppose, manufacturing prowess, their capacity utilization, etc. And this can lead to a kind of a growth cycle. But then, if you don't have enough money in the form of the savings, household savings, then this lending is impacted. That is when the RBI has got to tinker with the policy rates as well. So what is the alternative that the countries like India, they are witnessing because of low household savings rate? The alternative which you will find in the economic setup is that this money is being replaced by the FIIs and the FPIs, basically putting dollar into the Indian market. So that is what makes the country's economy much more volatile, much more exposed to external risks. That is when you will find that a slight fluctuation in the dollar market leads to a wider ramification in the domestic setup. So, in order to reduce the overall dependence on the dollar market, that is where the household saving needs to go up. How do you improve your household savings? Reduce the out-of-pocket expenditure that the families go through. For example, give them proper access to healthcare, educational facilities at nominal rates. Don't let them pay more for that. So, for that, you need welfare schemes. Provide them an uh, a kind of a cheaper availability of food grains, control the inflation. For that, what do you need? You need food security. You need enough production, right? So if you carry out these measures, that is when the out-of-pocket expenditure will reduce. And that is when you will have a larger net savings rate in the economy, which is beneficial, okay? Now, after this, coming to the second article, now, this article is more generalistic in nature. This deals with the sector of civil aviation. This talks about Indian aviation, a case of air safety at a discount. Now, this basically article brings to light the various different types of dichotomies which exist in the aviation sector. And that is not only restricted to Indian aviation sector. That is something which is percolating and which is very prominent across the global market. Now, Indian aviation sector is one of the fastest growing aviation sectors as observed anywhere across the world presently. Other than and barring the COVID years, for the past couple of decades now, 
Indian aviation sector has consistently consistently shown a rise in almost double digits. The number of airplanes, the fleet sizes, they have been increasing. The number of airports being added has been increasing. The share of revenue of the non-metro airports has been increasing as compared to the share of the metro airports, that is, in airports in the metropolitan areas. Yes, it is also coupled with the fact that few of the airlines have not performed and few of the airlines, their functionality has gone down the drain. But that does not take away the reality that Indian aviation sector is going to experience a boom cycle for almost the next decade and a half. That is why you have close to around 1000 plane orders which are pending with the manufacturers for various different airlines from Air India to Indigo to Akasa Air. You have almost a 1000 plus fleet which has been ordered which is awaiting delivery. Now while this is the hunky dory side, the other side of the spectrum is the reality of air safety. Now this was brought forward to light in the ensuing Vistara Airlines crisis. Most of you would be aware that the Vistara Airlines, they have basically been cancelling the flights left, right and centre. In the past week alone, you have hundreds of flights which have been cancelled because of pilot unavailability. And why is it that you have a crew and a pilot unavailability? Because Vistara and Air India are going to be merged, right? Before the merging and in order to complete the merging process, the pilots, the co-pilots at Vistara, they were offered a contract that they had to sign by the end of the day or they could lose their command position when they would be merged in Air India. Now, owing to very strict work hours, and impractical demands from the side of the airlines, many of the pilots, they simply went on a leave. That meant that the airline had to cancel the flights. And simultaneously, many of the other pilots, they resigned en masse, that we are not going to work in such conditions. We are not going to work in conditions where the human rights, human values, they are not respected. So, this has brought to light the conditions in which the pilots and the airlines in general operate. Understand, this is on the backdrop of another news story which has developed today about that, the fact that Air India has entered into an agreement with Bang uh, Bangalore International Airport in order to develop it as a transportation hub. So while this economic development is also happening, simultaneously, the airlines are in crisis. And this article highlights the fact that, look, there have been multiple such events and incidents in the past couple of years themselves where they, that indicates a gross negligence of the passenger safety, the airline safety and in general the safety of the public life. For example, what this article highlights is that Ministry of Civil Aviation that had written basically to Kozikode Airport and it had talked about the Kozikode Airport requiring an area beyond the landing strip for safety measures owing to the study which was made for the crash which happened a couple of years back that is something which required a safety area now koi code did not do that now the season of the rains are coming in monsoon rains are coming in in monsoon season along with the poor visibility Aircraft tire slippages are the most common and frequent phenomena due to which the airlines oftentimes require, the planes oftentimes require a bit larger landing space. Now, with the lack of that safety zone, again that means what? That you are putting many lives at risk just because Koi Code Airport did not respond and you did not take any punitive action because you had the fact or the danger in mind that the passenger and the amount of passenger revenue which is coming to Koi Code Airport that might get disrupted. Something similar has been observed in the region of the Calicut Airport also. So all these factors basically they talk about what? That safety is something which is easily being put at risk. Other than that you also had a situation that in January 2024 
you had the Minister of Civil Aviation who posted a tweet on X, the platform. And in that tweet, he said that, look, upon further analysis and in-depth study, it was found out that multiple pilots, they are going through a fatigue, right? Owing to very long working hours, lack of proper uh, manner of holidays or week offs and day offs, they are going through a fatigue factor, which puts passenger safety at risk and the airline at risk. So that is why he urged the airlines to maintain that kind of a work schedule, whereby mandatory norms are fulfilled that the pilot and the co-pilot, they don't get fatigued. And a deadline was placed that by 1st of June 2024, all the airlines have to comply with it. Immediately what happened? You had all the airlines with their petitions, etc. going to the Ministry of Civil Aviation that look, if we put that kind of a work roster that every pilot will get two days off or one day necessarily week off, then that we don't have that much crew. We don't have those many pilots. So that means there will be cancelling of flights and that will impact our operations. So in March, the Ministry of Civil Aviation has suspended that order almost infinitely. So you never know or you don't know when that order will be implemented again. So when we talk about the risk that is present, what, what are the risks that the sector is exposed to when it comes to the safety levels. So the first risk is long duty hours, factor of fatigue, right? Then lack of proper infra at airports like Calicut and Koikod, right? Many of the airlines, they are running at a very brink because the landing strip is not long enough. It does not fulfill the safety requirements, etc. Then other than that, you have a significant shortage of crew. When it comes to even training the new pilots, there is a substantial shortage. When it comes to ensuring maintenance and ensuring the reskilling of pilots, there also there is a shortage. When it comes to simulator training, which is an important part of that pilot training program, there is a shortage. So as a result of that, there are serious implications which are felt in terms of maintaining the roster, in terms of ensuring the flight time, etc. So what is the way forward? This article suggests that look, one of the way forward is that for example, in India, when you go for pilot training, you end up spending somewhere upwards of close to around 50 lakhs and it can go up till one CR as well. That is the amount of money that you will spend in pilot training. Now, many of the pilot training centers abroad they offer it at a cheaper rate. So you will find many of the young aspirants who want to be pilots, they go to uh, countries like South Africa to gain their pilot training. Now, if you have gained your pilot training in, let's suppose, South Africa, you are not allowed automatically to operate in India. So this should be smoothened out. So if you maintain a and a normal accreditation, ICAO accreditation, other than that, take a entry level test, a kind of a nominal entry level test and allow those people to work in India, provided they pass that test, provided they pass the simulator training, allow them to work. So once you do that, what will happen? Standardization of procedure will happen. Pilots operating across the world can also operate in India. And more so, large amount or large number of Indian pilots who have trained abroad working in foreign airlines, they would jump on the opportunity to work in India. That is where you can ward off or fight some amount of crew shortages. Secondly, the retired professionals, the re retired pilots, 
one needs to deploy them for let's suppose aircraft inspections for example pilot training crew training for example simulator training that will also free up many of the trained pilots who are doing that job and will put them into flying hours now that does what it improves the number of pilots that you have in your roster so you can provide leaves required leaves to many of the pilots and go along with the proper functionality without the factor of fatigue then you also have to develop proper skilling centers all the various airlines they can basically invest in these skilling centers that will give them long term dividend and long term return at the end of the day the safety parameter in terms of the airport's infrastructure requirement that needs to be taken a look at seriously without exceptions only in that scenario can we ward off any potential disaster because history is laden with instances where there has been case that pilot has been overburdened so the pilot actually fell asleep or under the pressure of that moment he could not take a correct decision and that has led to the flight crashing leading to a kind of death for and casualties for large number of people so that is the situation which is never advisable and not something that people will look forward to so in order to avoid that disaster we need to take these curative steps only then flight travel can be considered to be safe again okay now then coming to the next article which deals with the defense sector it has also appeared in the editorial section of the newspaper this is marching ahead with technology absorption now technology where technology in the armed forces the role of technology in the armed forces has been ever so increasing at an exponential pace now this particular year the indian army is observing 2024 as the year of technology absorption right where disruptive technologies disruptive technologies such as ai wireless communication signal blocking stealth these disruptive technologies are being discussed and are being worked upon you have greater involvement of the startups and all of this is being done on the backdrop and the backbone of atmanirbharta or self dependence that in the armed forces is very much required that self dependence and self manufacturing is an important keystone in defense reliability so this article talks about how that technology should be assimilated should it be the case that we bring in newer technology and discard the older technologies altogether no that is not the way to go in the case of armed forces now here instances have also been given instances for example in the russia ukraine war now in the russia ukraine war as most of you would be aware that in the initial days ukraine gained a sizable amount of advantage because of the technology measures that it would deploy and disrupt the russian armed forces movement but russia again after 2 years has been clawing back that advantage and presently it is a significant advantage to the russian forces now why is it that russian forces have clawed back that advantage because they have fallen back and relied on the existing and conventional military methodologies for example consolidating your defense frontier that okay this is the line that i have a strong supply network logistics network this is a line that i will hold and wherever possible i will advance but i will never let the opponent breach that line now that is a kind of a military methodology which has been in usage since world war 1 that is something that russia has been deploying again so that tells you what that there is still a lot of space for conventional military tactics but when it comes to disruptive technologies disruptive tech like ai communication tech radio seeking devices etc signals tech now this disruptive tech for its integration into the armed forces first of all you need acquisition you need to acquire that tech 
then you need absorption and then utilization across the armed forces. So acquisition, adaptation or absorption and integration with the armed forces. These are the three stages which are required to be fulfilled. Now, simply acquiring these newer tech, let's suppose from a foreign country, will that solve the purpose? That, okay, why are we manufacturing Tejas aircraft on our own when it is not so good? Let us simply go and buy F-16s that US is offering. Pakistan also has that. So we are getting massive FOMO that we should also have that. No. Acquisition of new tech, if it is done on the backdrop of your own defense industrial complex and the establishment which is there in your own country, that adds significant amount of flexibility for the armed forces to realize the potential of the tech. For example, let's suppose you consider any of the platforms such as the light helicopters, the light combat helicopters which have been made. Now, because they have been developed in India, now its utility and utilization in various different sectors of the war front can be exploited. If let's suppose you have imported the Apache helicopters from US, now they are attack helicopters, they are the most potent helicopter anywhere across the world. But then they will have a series of limitations user limitations that you have bought it from US. So you are always wary that, okay, here you cannot use it. In the dry deserts, you can have a limited utility. In the high altitudes, you will have limited utility. But if you develop that kind of a resource and that technology in your in-house domestic industrial defense complex, then your utilization will be much more. Then after that, not only you, that acquisition should be done from the domestic level. When we talk about adaptation, that adaptation of that technology, it should not only be present at the top levels, it should actually filter down. That is the lower rank officials in the armed forces, they should be aware about the utilization of the technology. So downward penetration of the technology has to happen because it is the lower ranked officials who will lead the in the battlefront right you won't have the generals and the brigadiers running amok in the battlefront you will have the jcos and the lower ranked officials so that information for adaptation has to reach that level so that is why the adaptation or absorption knowledge has to filter down okay, has to filter down. Then along with that, when we talk about deployment and implementation, or let's suppose the final integration of that technology into the armed units, armed convoys, then it should not be the case that completely uproot the older systems and implement the newer systems then the existing legacy setups that you have, for example, tanks, for example, you have howitzers, the guns, the large guns that you have. Now, they won't be able to operate seamlessly. That is why newer technology has to be integrated into the existing setup. Every armed force has got a required ratio of new tech to the older legacy tech. No armed force across the world will you come across where they have completely debunked the old tech and completely relied on the new tech. Slow and steady evolution takes place. That is the key functionality of the military doctrines. So that is where integration of the new tech with the legacy systems is also a requirement. So that is new tech with legacy setups like tanks, legacy systems like tanks. Okay, now this is where this article also talks about the fact that look, you have even in the Russia-Ukraine war, multiple tanks, for example, they were exposed to enemy attacks. So immediately the world talked about the fact that how tanks are very old tech and tanks don't work in the modern warfare anymore. 
But with the help of this tank brigade, Russian forces gained some advantage in certain areas. So again, that means that your old system using the newer technology can be deployed. For example, if tanks move in cluster, they can be easily easy target of even the man portable launching devices. Right, an individual with a stinger missile or an individual with, uh, let's suppose, an anti-tank cannon missile can shoot down multiple tanks in one go and remain hidden. So, the newer tech where you use it is, for example, disperse the tanks. Don't put them together, disperse them. And not only disperse them, use carriers or use vehicles for electronic jamming of those regions, of the areas where the tanks are going. So that requires signal communication to its next level. So that electronic jamming when you do, then the tanks can't be found by, let's suppose, the aircrafts and the air launched missiles or the man portable launching devices. So that is where you can protect the legacy systems, carry the punch power, maintain the supremacy by the usage and the integration of newer tech. But this would involve not only the integration of systems, integration of manpower also. That integration of manpower is going to be a key challenge for the defense sector. When we say integration of manpower, what does that mean? Let's suppose you have an individual organization, an individual startup, which has come up with a new tech, a ground breaking, a path breaking tech. Now, that manpower or that individual organization needs to train a lot of people in the armed forces up to the lowest level so that a cross operationalization can be done and it can be done smoothly. So that is where the training and command centers, they do, need not be centralized anymore and that manpower needs to percolate downwards. Only then will you maintain a fighting edge. Because understand, Modern warfare is not fought by numbers. It was the era of around World War I and even before the Battle of Panipat that you recall. That is where large historic peons used to be written that the Lodhis, they had an armed forces of 1.25 lakhs. Babur had only 12 and a half thousand troops. In World War I, the Germans on this side basically piled up millions and the Western powers piled up another millions. That era of warfare is gone. Now, just saying that we are the third largest army or the second largest armed forces going to be in terms of absolute manpower does not mean that you have that fighting strength. It is the role of technology, the teeth to tail ratio in the armed forces. Teeth to tail as in your fighting ability, your punching power associated and mixed with accompanied with the total amount of manpower that you are carrying. So the modern armed forces, they are lean in structure, technologically heavy, and also diverse in terms of operation that they can operate in various theaters. That is the aspect of absorption of technology. It is not a one day job or a one year job or even a 10 year job. It is the change in the policy mindset. And that is where the article also argues that Aat Nirbharta, based upon and backed by this disruptive tech, is for sure going to bring wonders in Indian armed forces. Okay? Now, moving on to the next article. That is, heat affects India's aim to move from coal to renewables. So, basically, due to the heat wave, and aided with that, along with that heat wave, we are facing water scarcity at an unprecedented level. Due to this, there have been various different issues that the entire country is facing. And that has been depicted in this article with the help of the charts here. First of all, if you take a simple look at the map of the country, in both these cases, one represents the maximum temperature expected for the month of April, June, and another represents the minimum temperature expected for the month of April, June. So both maximum and minimum temperature across the country, they are indicating a trend which is going to be above normal, around 3 to 4 degrees Celsius hotter than the previous year. So due to all of this, the peak energy demand is rising up. 
Now, that is indicated by this particular chart. Now, here if you observe that the peak energy demand for the month of March over the past few years, in 2013, our energy demand was around 114 gigawatts. Now, in 2024, that has increased to 190 gigawatts. So, our peak energy demand has increased. And it will increase furthermore in the month of April and in the month of May. Now, as this demand has increased, our generation capability is purely relied upon conventional methods of electricity generation. For example, coal-based thermal power plants. As you can see, the representation or the share of the coal-based thermal power generation is around 70% of the overall power generation. Right? The amount of power that is generated here is quite significantly increasing. But the share of coal is still very high. So as India faces this rough season or the rough condition of heat waves, etc. And the event of climate change is upon us. That is going to make the fulfillment of energy requirement much more difficult with the help of renewables. So what are the challenges there? First of all, high demand. When you have high demand, that sudden high demand, it cannot be fulfilled with the help of solar energy or wind energy. Why? Because when we talk about solar energy, wind energy, there the supply is intermittent. The supply is not continuous throughout 24 hours. And you need a very good and a strong storage capability. For that, technology is not available easily. So solar energy is quite intermittent. And the applicability on a very large scale is something which is being still worked upon, which India is marching towards. So as a consequence of that, you have a higher reliance on coal, right? Reliance on coal. Now, when we talk about renewables in our country, amongst the renewables, what are the various sources? One is solar, another is hydropower. That is with the help of dams, for example. Now, in the case of solar energy, we have talked about it. It is intermittent, requires a lot of storage structure, etc. What about the hydropower potential? Even that hydropower or hydroelectricity is not being generated to the required amount because of water shortages. Okay, so because of that, this hydropower generation is not happening to the potential because of water shortage in various reservoirs across the country. Why? Due to climate change and reduced amount of rainfall which is received. Now, the solar we have talked about is regular. So, while this is the problem with the renewables, consistently the demand is moving higher up. So as the demand is growing higher up, our reliance on coal is set to increase. So that means our ability to fulfill the climate goals, that will be held in jeopardy. Why? And what climate goals are we talking about? So in the conference of parties number 26 to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was held in December 2021 in Glasgow, India had made certain promises to the world. Amongst those promises was the fact that 500 gigawatt of power generation capacity will be added from renewable, right? And 50% of its power will be generated by non-fossil fuel energy sources. Now, both these will be put at risk, right? Because you will fall back again and again on the coal power generation itself. Now, by the way, Climate change also impacts the amount of power generated by coal. Because even in the coal thermal power plants, you need what? Water is required for washing of the coal, for availability of water in the demineralization plant. Significant amount of water is required. Shortage of water in the reservoirs and 
high amount of heat wave meant that the supply of water to the industrial sector, to the power generating sector was reduced. As a result of that, India overall lost huge potential for coal power generation because of that shortage of water. But still, the amount of flexibility which is available in the coal power generation, the load factor that they can withstand, the flexibility in terms of scaling up and scaling down the amount of production, all of that is what still makes coal the favorable option for power production in our country. Okay? That is what the article is about. Now moving to the next article. That is the different approaches to AI regulation or the regulation of the artificial intelligence sector. Now this article has been written on the backdrop of a UN resolution on AI regulation which has been unanimously passed. That resolution which was co-sponsored by almost 123 countries and including China was passed unopposed without voting. So almost all the 193 countries of the UN, they agree to the aspect of regulation of AI because the world is waking up to the reality that AI, while it has got significant amount of advantage associated, it can also open up a can of worms. Because you and I on our personal scale, on our personal level, when we operate the mobile phones, we are exposed to AI chatbots, AI bots, which are present on the phone and which puts our lives at risk. Our decision making ability, our choosing ability, our choices, etc. Everything is put at risk. That is why AI needs to be regulated. Now, there are various different types of models followed by places across the world. But when you take a look at the UN resolution, the UN resolution is quite forward looking in that manner that it seeks to attain international collaboration. So the key points of the UN re resolution that you will see that it aims to close the digital divide between the rich and the poor countries. Because as of now, what is the condition? The rich countries who have developed significant amount of technological prowess, they are the ones who have developed that AI systems. They will be keeping on developing that in the future as well, whereas the poorer countries, the financially not well to do countries, they will never be able to match up. So there will always be that divide. And that divide means a divide in terms of the capability generation of these countries in order to fight climate change, agricultural crisis, weather prediction, etc. All of that will be taken over by the AI. So the poorer countries will always be dependent on the richer countries. So that is something that the resolution aims to address. Right now, it aims to make sure that the developing countries have the technology and the capabilities to take advantage of the AI systems, including detecting diseases, predicting floods, helping farmers, recognizes the rapid acceleration of the AI tech and urgently achieving the global consensus on safe, secure and trustworthy systems, reliant systems. Okay. And governance of AI system is an evolving area because AI in itself is evolving. You cannot have a final fixed point that this is how we will regulate the sector. That also needs to evolve. So that talks about this resolution being a kind of an evolving mechanism, which is a good news, which means you can have flexible policy making going ahead into the future. So this is one of a kind resolution which has been passed by the UN, which further strengthens the reliance on multilateralism, the belief in the multilateral system that UN can actually bring some good. But if you take a look at the AI regulation which is being observed in various different countries, the e European Union's regulation stands out. Because what the European Union regulation has done, it has basically bifurcated or rather it has divided the AI systems into areas of unacceptable, high, limited and minimal risk. So the sectors have been divided into unacceptable risk high risk, right, minimal and limited risk. For example, if you have an app or an AI system, 
which enters or which is present in the phone and which can influence the consumer choices, that is an absolute no-go area. So there, the regulation is very stringent and is very strict. Similarly, when we talk about generative AI, generative AI such as ChatGPT, there also, what are the materials that the AI system or the AI bot will go through in order to have that capability or that learning that is being regulated. For example, for in order to generate a response, a chatbot like ChatGPT would have gone through thousands and hundreds of thousands of documents available online. Now, based upon what are the documents it goes through, that is the system that it will, the response that it will generate. So, regulate the things that it goes through, that it scrolls through. And then, you can have a better AI. So, that is the concept of EU's regulation. That is why it is quite forward looking in that matter. China, on the other hand, has gone for a model which relies upon absolute censorship. That look, we will regulate the content, as is the case, even in online medium. So we will regulate the content. We will talk about improving the capability of the state monitoring system also. And overall, and overall monitoring of the AI is what Chinese policy talks about. UK talks about improving the capability of the officials, the monitoring system, and a kind of case-by-case -case basis study which again is haphazard, ad hoc, and is never going to be comprehensive enough. This is where the role of India comes in. India has allocated around 10,000 crores of corpus for the AI fund. In the next decade, by 2030, we will have more than 10,000 startups working in the area of deep tech and in the area of AI. So for us, understanding how to regulate AI is of paramount importance. While AI can have far-reaching benefits, such as diseases, diagnostics, how to take care of the marginalized sections of the society, financial regulation, and robust infrastructure, simultaneously, AI opens up a can of worms. And in already an unequal country like India, AI can further exaggerate that inequality. That is why India not only needs to be aware, but also needs to be proactive when it comes to finalizing the AI regulation norms and taking industry on board will go a long way forward. Okay, so this article, what is it that we have seen? The UN resolution for AI, then after that, the EU's regulation for AI, what is the norm that they follow? They follow the norm by dividing the systems on the risk level and thereby monitoring them. But along with that, also how the generative AI like chat GPT, what are the things that they go through before learning that? Then the Chinese system, the UK system, and where is the role that India finds itself in? Okay, now coming to the next article. Right against climate change is a fundamental right, as has been observed by Supreme Court. Now, in a kind of a landmark judgment, Supreme Court basically has observed that right against climate change and right to clean environment, both of them have to be considered a fundamental right. Under what provision? Under the provisions of Article 14 and Article 21, that is right to life. Article 14 talks about right to equality and Article 21 talks about the right to life. So under the provisions of these two, right against climate change has been considered as a fundamental right as per the interpretation of the Supreme Court. Now, what this case is about. So you had a case which was ongoing in the region of in Supreme Court, basically, which talked about the great Indian bustard. Now, great Indian bustard, which is a critically endangered species, typically to be found in the wastelands of Gujarat and Rajasthan. At one point of time, it was spread over to central India also, spread over to the region of Pakistan also, but presently largely restricted in the dry and desertified areas of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Now, these great Indian bustards, 
they often times get entangled in the power lines which pass through and that leads to a large scale death so because of that there was a case which was going in the supreme court now supreme court while making its judgment also talked about the aspect of a better environment which ensures the survivability of all species and along with that the fight against climate change now this supreme court observation is based upon certain fundamentals that we have been discussing for the past few days as well that when we talk about climate change its impact is not uniform across the society is it so when we talk about climate change for example here you have to understand that let's suppose availability of clean water clean drinking water that is not equally available for all the population the rich will have access to it in terms of water security and conditions of water security whereas the poor will not so that infringes article 14 then right to health right to a quality and standard health is already a part of article 21 right to life so that is where the aspect of drawing the healthy living condition is derived from that premise of right to health because due to climate change what do you face lack of clean drinking water for example more exposure to diseases exposure to diseases shortage of food supply because of heat waves uneventful rain or uh, unscheduled rainfall supply heat waves and health hazards and health hazards right now all of this is because of climate change and it infringes on what infringes upon right to health right to health now this right to health is ensured by article 21 under the overall umbrella ages of right to life so that is where supreme court has argued that people should have that right to against climate change and right to cleaner environmental living okay everybody has got that right because climate change happens to have an impact on an unequal level poor gets impacted more by the heat waves water scarcity as well as the incidence of floods for example diseases for example now other factor that the supreme court judgment talks about is the requirement of india as a country to move from a thermal power generating country to a solar power generating country where solar power has to gain precedence and it has listed reasons also so that switch to solar power is also something that the supreme court has nudged the country to first of all to reduce emissions emissions because the emissions they are worsening the quality of air across the entirety of the country so to reduce the emission levels to manage to have cleaner power cleaner power availability okay so here basically that when we talk about the overall power requirement of our country that is also increasing so rather than generating by coal why not generate by solar then declining groundwater and decreasing annual rainfall also because when we talk about water shortage water shortage also impacts they impact the coal power generation also so all of this lays a perfect reason for why the country should be switching over to solar power this is what the supreme court judgment talks about it talks about what this climate change is 
how it is influencing, how it is impacting the health of the poorer sections. So it infringes on Article 14, right to equality. It infringes on right to health, Article 21. So that is why the right against climate change has to be included as a part of Article 21, as a part of right to life, because right against climate change and right to live in a clean and healthy environment, both have been said and named as the two sides of the same coin, which ensures a healthy living and a healthy life, meaningful life as per Article 21 of the Constitution. Okay. Now, after this, coming to the few articles relevant for your prelims. So, strong link between high glycemic index diet and diabetes. A study has been carried out. And it has been found out that when you have or amongst the population which had a high body mass index, what is a body mass index? That is your weight and the ratio of the height. So that indicates whether you are in a perfect healthy zone or you are overweight or you are, let's suppose, having an underweight. Now, if you have a high body mass index, means if you are bulky and if you are consuming along with that, the food which have a high glycemic index that can lead to type 2 diabetes. Now here what is that glycemic index or what is that glycemic level? So many food items such as carbohydrates, the carbs, the various different other sugars etc. When that is taken into the body, the body then high glycemic index. Okay, so high glycemic index is to be found in foods such as sugar, sweetened drinks, white polished rice, potatoes, white bread. Whereas non fibrous or rather non starchy vegetables, fruits, grains, brown rice, lentils, they are considered to be low GI foods, that is, low glycemic index foods. Okay, so this study has been carried out by measuring the blood sugar which is generated in the body after consumption of a meal. As a country, India, which has a disproportionate amount of people suffering from type 2 diabetes, this is of a significant use and help because in our country, the dietary habits that are present, which is carbs based, that is the chapatis, the rice, etc. That is why you have an increased incidence of type 2 diabetes in our country, along with the fact that BMI index or the body mass index in our country generally is on the higher side of a larger population. So it is no longer about the availability of food, which can keep you away from diseases. It is about the type of food that you consume. In a country like India, that is why the low GI food the low glycemic index foods, one of them, for example, if you consider animal protein, that is, for example, eggs uh, and animal meat, etc., that has got an absolute low GI factor. But then, in case of vegetarian meals also, the pulses, the traditional pulses that you have, the fruits that you have, non-starchy vegetables that you have, they should be consumed so that the non-communicable disease load in our country, which contributes to 60% of the fatalities across the country, that comes down. Okay. Now, then the next article, where we see that Cochin Shipyard signs ship repair agreement with the US Navy. Now, Cochin Shipyard becomes the third agency or the third destination, so to say, which has signed an agreement for maintenance and repair of the US naval ships. Before that, US Navy had also signed that deal. Basically, it was uh, UK also which signed that with LNT at the Katupalli uh, shipyard, right near Chennai. So you had LNT signing that at Katupalli shipyard near Chennai. Then you had another that is Mazagao docks which has also signed this and then comes the Cochin Shipyard Limited or CSL. Now these three organizations have been signing deals about the maintenance and repair work that can be carried for the US naval ships. Why it is beneficial is that not only will it generate lot of jobs in the country, it will generate significant amount of economic activities in that particular region, but simultaneously it will also help develop India as a maintenance and repair hub. Understand 
that when we talk about the naval routes, India sits atop the Indian Ocean. So when we talk about the US ships which are so forward deployed away from their own coastline, they need repair activities to be done in a quick turnaround time. And that is where India comes into the picture. Now, once we gain expertise for that, then we can have these shipyards also carrying out maintenance and repair work for, let's suppose, the commercial uh, carriers as well. And that can generate a lot of revenue. Secondly, it also further cements our role in protecting the Indo-Pacific region because by ensuring a quick turnaround time of the naval vessels and interoperability between the UK vessels, uh, the vessels from, let's suppose, the Royal Navy of UK and the US Navy, that also means there will be an increased trust and increased reliance and interutilization of logistics, which is always beneficial to increase the security apparatus in the region of the Indian Ocean frequented by the Chinese naval force and Chinese naval force which is increasing in numerical strength. Okay, so these are the benefits associated with. So that is why in the past month or so, you will come across multiple such events where the US naval ship or the UK naval ship, they have been docked and they are carrying out the smaller repair works for which they would ideally have to go back to their own home base and that would take a lot of time. Okay. Now, TASL, Tata Advanced Systems Limited, has launched the TSAT-1A satellite on board the Bandwagon-1, that is the Bandwagon-1 mission, and it was launched from Florida in US on board, the SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. Now, this is a collaboration between TSL, TASL rather, and Satellogenic. Now, this... TSAT-1A, that is something which is relevant for your prelims examination. First of all, there can be an option that TSL was launched on board one of the GSLV-3 or GSLV-3A, uh, etc. rockets. That is incorrect. It was launched in US, right, on board the Falcon 9 uh, rocket. Now, then, what is its role? Then, this TSAT-1A high-resolution optical satellite images with increased collection capacity, dynamic range, and low latency delivery, right? So what it does, it improves the imaging ability, will help carrying out ground sensing, will help you uh, ensure a multi-spectral analysis of agricultural growth, of the forested areas, of the mineral presence, and this technology eventually can also be used for the civilian military purposes. But more importantly, it also cements India's private sector's role and increasing prowess in terms of the, uh, the satellite manufacturing and aerospace technology. Now, coming over to the last article of the day, and this is that you had the economist Manoj Panda being declared as the newest member of the 16th Finance Commission. Now, the 16th Finance Commission to be headed by Arvind Panagaria. That 16th Finance Commission will decide upon a host of factors. Many of them are quite contentious. For example, the amount of money that the southern states, they think that they deserve as compared to what do they get. So that has led to a lot of grievances. The amount of money which will be given based upon the population, that has also opened up a lot of grievances that as states who are doing well on the population parameter, why do they get less money? So there are multiple such contentious issues that the Finance Commission has to decide upon. But when we talk about the Finance Commission, the legitimacy of it is given by Article 280 of the Constitution. Article 280 of the Constitution talks about the President set appointing the Finance Commission. Now, this Finance Commission basically decides upon the devolution of funds and on three levels. So, the devolution of fund on the first level between center and states. That is the first level. Then, the formula to be distributed among the states. What is the amount to be distributed? So, for example, when we talk about center and states. So, earlier the amount of fund which was given to the states used to be 10%. Now, that has increased to 42%, the amount of money that you give to the states. So, 
that is decided by the finance commission recommendations are made by the finance commission then amongst the states what is the formula that you will deploy for distribution of funds amongst the states what is the share that you will give for green cover for population for infrastructure for area etc and then it also decides upon the grants on aid the grants that you give to the various different states which is given by the central government now these are made based upon and these formulations are made as recommendations to the central government okay now it is up to the central government to basically adopt all these recommendations accept these recommendations or reject them in general you what we have seen is that all the central governments they generally accept all the recommendations made by the finance commission and add few tweaks here and there for the purpose of implementation now in case the central government does not accept any recommendation it has to give an explanation into the parliament about the reason why that recommendation was not accepted okay so that is the purview of the finance commission the 16th finance commission under the chairmanship of arvind par garia will and has held its first meeting and going ahead forward it will decide upon the very crucial matters of financial devolution and the distribution of funds now after that we come to the questions the practice questions discuss the implications of low household savings on national growth now here you have to talk about the interconnect and the interrelation between the national savings the household savings and the national growth so in the first part in the introduction you have to talk about the household savings so and you can start by the national savings so national savings which forms an important parameter of the national growth consists of savings by the households the corporates and the government the household saving comprises close to around 20% of the overall savings now that completes your intro about the national uh, about the household saving then talk about the fact that the household saving is divided into financial and non financial give the example now why is it that this financial saving is low a couple of reasons other than that talk about the fact that if this financial savings are low means the loanable amount available by the banks that is less means their ability to lend to the corporates to for capital assets etc that is lower and that has got an impact on capital creation asset creation etc you can draw the flow chart also here and then if the scope is there if it is a 15 marker question then you can also talk about what can be done to improve and increase the household saving level analyze the reasons for inclusion of right against climate change as a fundamental right so here straight away you have to talk about inequalities and how climate change basically infringes upon article 14 and article 21 uh, in terms of the right to health and also right to equality because the impact of climate change is felt at a kind of an unequal rate it exaggerates the inequality in the society okay so that is something that you can write about try writing the answers on your own and thereby improve in this slowly and steadily okay so that will be all for our newspaper discussion and analysis today if you have liked the video please don't forget to click on the like share and the subscribe button till we meet again do take care of yourself thank you and goodbye